Union of European Federalists. Hello and welcome to our discussion on the occasion of today's International Day of Press Freedom. The World Press Freedom Day, as it was originally called by UNESCO, is meant to be a reminder to governments of the need to respect their commitment to press freedom. And it is also meant to be a day of reflection among media professionals and a day of remembrance for those journalists who lost their lives for investigating too deeply and speaking out too loudly. Today, we would like to honor these topics by shedding a spotlight on the media situation in Hungary. We will talk about the courage of independent media makers and their fate over time, and we will discuss the methods of Prime Minister Viktor Orban and his illiberal regime when it comes to manipulate the public discourse. Is there any press freedom left at all in Hungary? How did the end of the diverse media landscape and the silencing of opposing perspectives happen so seemingly easily? And unresisted, without a big and loud resistance coming from within the country, but also from the opposition and also internationally speaking. And what does all of this have to do with his recent re-election? Where is Hungary standing now and how will the future of the country and media landscape look like? And last but not least, what can and should be done right now by media makers all over the world by the EU and by the civil society. I'm looking forward to profound answers to all these questions from our two distinguished experts on the topic. Esther Nodge is an economist, economist teacher, former diplomat and a civil activist. She studied global economy relations at the Central European University and since 2018 she has been secretary general of the Hungarian section of the Union of European Federalists. Since 2021, she is a member of the UEF Executive Bureau. She has organized events related to the rule of law as well as to media freedom and also published articles in the Federalist debate. Hello and thank you for being here. Otmar Lahodinsky. Thank you. <laughs> Otmar Lahodinsky has been the president of the Association of European Journalists for years now and an organization. Um, this is an organization that dedicates their efforts towards press freedom and European integration. Since 1999, he is an active journalist, has served as European editor for the Austrian weekly news magazine Profil and has written for newspapers like Der Courier and Die Presse. He has interviewed Actually, numerous... I'm sorry, I'm it even old, more. So I started in '76. <laughs> no, great. <laughs> I'm not that young. All right, that much for a distinguished uh, journalist career. You also interviewed numerous well-known personalities, such as Mikhail Gorbachev, Angela Merkel, and the Dalai Lama. And you also published various books and received several awards for your outstanding journalistic works. Thank you both for being here today, and hello and warm welcome to you, Otmar at that point also. So we will do it like that. I will ask some questions and whoever of you two would like to answer just goes for it. Uh, the other one can add, uh, can comment, but doesn't have to. And I would also like to start with um, a most uh, current event with the re-election of Viktor Orban. Um, he won again a constitutional majority for the fourth time in a row in Hungary. So what made that result possible? Thanks, Nana, for this question, and thanks uh, for the invitation and for this, organizing this event. And uh, I would like to go back as early as 2010, because you mentioned that it's already the fourth term that Orban gained with a constitutional majority. And you have to know that originally the Hungarian election system was already favoring the winner. So 2010 allowed a landslide victory for Orban, but he immediately wanted to make sure that he will unlike, it will be unlikely for him to lose the elections. So the first three laws that he changed was the media law, the election law, and the constitution. So they could do this with the constitutional majority without any consultation with the opposition. And this was the start of a journey of backsliding, of democratic backsliding. And now we talk about media, so the focus is, is media freedom. And uh, as early as December 2010, so he was elected in, in the springtime 2010, so they already um, inaugurated the law at the end of the year, which paved the way 
for reducing, for, for restricting media freedom gradually. And uh, there are some um, uh, specific aspects, the creation of a new media authority, the regulation about uh, public broadcasting, and also the, the obligation to provide new services in all media channels. It doesn't seem very brutal at first sight, but there were already great criticism in the journalist associations in Europe by the, on the European level. And this was only a start that uh, allowed these developments uh, that were happening. And just to give you uh, a few milestones, in 2016, uh, the biggest daily newspaper, Nev Sabacak, was closed down from one day to another. In 2020, in July 2020, index.au, that was a, one of the biggest news portals, was there was a, a hostile takeover. And also Club Radio lost the frequency, which is the biggest independent radio in since uh, 21 February 14. And just to see the impact of the election, right after the election, another community radio, Tilos Radio, lost the frequency. So they re didn't renew the frequency. So that means that Orban is really using this media law and the economic surrounding in order to restrict media freedom. And there are, I would like to just highlight uh, uh, two more elements which are not so much in focus. This is, uh, on one hand, the big billboard campaigns. Uh, you have to know that Fidesz got eight times as many billboards than the opposition. And this was in the value of around 8 million euros or so. And uh, they could submit those, uh, they could um, uh, broadcast those, those messages in this push media, which were in every corner of the, of the country, in the smallest village, you saw the big billboards. And we will talk about the war information. And the other factor is even in social media, the government could finance more advertisements. So there was an overwhelming hegemony of uh, government propaganda. And I didn't mention the Central European Press and Media Foundation, which includes 470 media outlets and which is absolutely controlled by the government. So as a start, I think it's enough and we can continue to talk about the content and uh, misinformation and all kinds of stuff. So this made it possible that he won uh, this time as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Otmar, would you like to add? If I, yes. If I may add what Esther said, uh, by the way, there was an uh, Austrian businessman who was involved in buying up uh, Neb Sabajak in 2016. And, you know, from one day to the other, um, he closed down and, and some of the journalists couldn't even enter the, the building. They couldn't even take out their belongings. I mean, it was... It was really uh, mad, and 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 the the Austrian businessman declared, yes, he bought it, uh, but then he was asked why, why did you close it? He, he was very vague about it and said, oh yeah, he studied the um, the the, the uh, business um, figures, and he found out that it has no. Uh, possibility to survive, so he closed it down. And, and uh, yeah, and and uh, the other thing, uh, why I think um, you mentioned that I think more than eighty percent of all the media, maybe now even more, <laughs> is under state or government control. And uh, uh, of course, the opposition leader, Mr. Peter Markizai. Zoy, he he had no practically no access to to TV time, and imagine, I mean, normally there would be a TV uh, a TV debate uh, between Mr. Orban and Mr. Marky Zoy. There was none. Yeah, can you imagine in Europe? There was even a, a TV debate between Macron and, and Marine Le Pen. And in every country that normally you will see in TV, there was there was also Joe Biden and Donald Trump, at least one, I think, was. So in Hungary, no, because why? Mr. Orban didn't like it. So 
Mr. Uh, the opposition leader, Mr. Makisai, was practically absent from from uh, state-owned or state-controlled TV, uh, and, and 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 no no uh, TV debate. Can you imagine? So he he was not able to explain what is his program. How would he be? different from 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 Viktor Orban and of course it was a bit difficult the whole opposition um, the opposition uh, alliance you know there were six parties really from the left to the right and uh, they had a hard time of course to um, to find a, a common uh, common ground and uh, and then Final remark, uh, I, I, I noticed that uh, I think that the war in Ukraine helped uh, Mr. Orban a lot, yeah, because he said that he, he will, if he's elected, or he, he will guarantee that Hungary will stay out of the conflict. And Mr. Orban was even more neutral than neutral Austria, you know, Hungary was, is a NATO member and he behaved as a like a Swiss uh, president or Austrian uh, prime minister, as he said, uh, he, he will guarantee uh, not even any armament will be shipped through Hungary to, uh, to Ukraine. And uh, then he went to Putin. Yeah, uh, um, uh, after, the, after the war broke out, he went to Putin. And what did he do there? He, he kind of uh, secured... Uh, cheap natural gas uh, for for Hungary because Hungary pays a lot uh, less than, than than other countries for 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 natural gas. And then final thing, why he won, uh, he he gave out uh, money to to the Hungarians. Uh, apparently, money also coming from the EU subsidies. <laughs> Because uh, Hungary gets uh, every year some five billion euro uh, net, more or less, from from all funds, and uh, he gave out the money not only buying these uh, uh, poster boards, billboards for for his uh, publication in in the whole country. You could see his face and his slogans. And uh, Makizai was sometimes seen a little bit, uh, but it uh, and, and and he gave out money. Uh, he gave um, uh, there was a thirteenth salary for the retired persons. Suddenly, uh, then what he did because uh, petrol prices rose in whole Europe, not in Hungary. He kind of fr froze the prices of petrol. In October already, I think if it uh, if it's still frozen, I don't know whether after the elections it's still uh, low. Uh -huh. So, uh, but I think he will he will have to to raise uh, the prices uh, pretty soon because it's uh, even Austrians uh, living near the border they go to Hungary to fill up because they they save something like fifty euro. For for one uh, uh, filling up uh, the car, and uh, all kinds of other, uh, yeah, he, he also froze the prices for several foodstuffs, yeah, in in the supermarket. So he was really behaving as a populist, and uh, he gave out uh, money to to all kind of of people. And I think that was the main reason why he was uh, elected, because, uh, yeah, money pays, and he gave out money but it was as if it was his private money. No, it came from the state. It's taxpayers' money, and it is EU, EU, EU funds. So I think it's very clever by the EU now. They waited for the elections, but now I think the new um, kind of procedure judicial procedure against Hungary as uh, not respecting uh, the EU rule of law uh, has been started. And the, the other one is that uh, Hungary did not get uh, the, the money for the corona 
for the Corona Fund for helping uh, Hungarian economy is also blocked. It's something like 12 billion euro. Uh, but I think with that, uh, at least uh, almost the, the whole sum will be released maybe pretty soon. So it was no, no wonder that uh, Mr. Orban won uh, a fifth time. May I, may I just give some pre pre uh, specification? Because uh, uh, actually you are right, Markizai, the opposition's candidate, had virtually no time. That was, the time that he had was exactly five minutes. But you have to know that on that day, it was after the March 15 uh, and were, uh, like celebration, and Viktor Orban made a speech. And before Markizai's five minutes, they broadcasted Orban's speech, and afterwards they broadcasted Orban's speech. And somebody counted that on that day alone, they broadcasted Orban's speech nine times. So as opposed to the five minutes, what Mark Izai had on TV. And uh, the other thing, what uh, you mentioned also, this, um, this cap for the fuel has just been renewed until the beginning of July. So I guess they have no idea how to get out of it. But the problem is that it creates shortages because some small fuel stations will go bankrupt because they cannot finance the difference, the gap between the, the market price and this uh, artificial price. And we feel a little bit like in socialist times, you know, when the market price was artificially eliminated and there were state uh, prices, you know, state uh, defined prices. So this, and, and I, the third thing that I wanted to uh, tell you that uh, I also got a tax refund because all the families who had children got a tax refund. But the interesting thing was that I got an envelope from the tax authority in February. And I said to myself, why in February, you know, there is no tax declaration. And then I opened the envelope from the tax authority and there was a letter signed by Viktor Orban telling me that they do so much for the families and that the former Yurchan government hasn't done anything for the families. And he signed it that he sends his greetings with this tax refund. You know, and this is also the, it shows clearly how he played with the state money uh, doing uh, party propaganda uh, with the taxpayers' money, what you just highlighted. So this, this was absolutely um, making an impact, uh, obviously. Thank you so much for opening the Pandora's box. As I have the feeling now I have so many questions at the same time. Uh, let's stay for this first period of uh, uh, question rounds at uh, this re-election phase. Um, one uh, little question, I mean, for us in Austria, for example, there exists a constitution and there is media law and there is a kind of a uh, the necessity for public media to um, broadcast uh, the same amount of uh, differing opposing uh, political um, opinions uh, because uh, we, we can't only promote one <laughs> political party it's not allowed is there something like that not existing in hungary it's incredible public value um, television some some rule of law for you know um, giving opposition time well, there is a media authority which is completely controlled by the government. And whenever they have, so they, they don't, they find um, media outlets that they aim to find. For example, that was the reason why they didn't renew a frequency of club radio because of some administrative mistakes in the application. Some say that they didn't sign the bank blank pages. That was like a very, uh, you know, artificial um, claim. But whenever there is a huge uh, unbalance, then they don't do anything because they are fully they are appointed by the parliament and the parliament has the two third majority. So basically, this media council is dysfunctional, is totally dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that clarification. And another um, question uh, still um, uh, uh, pointing to the election. Um, the war in Ukraine, you mentioned, you both mentioned it already as being a major factor. Has there also been um, something like Russian influence or presence even uh, in the Hungarian media landscape? Has there been a specific, uh, um, specifically aimed misinformation campaigns, for example, something like that? Uh, if I may continue, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Russian state, the, the Hungarian state television um, 
diffused uh, basically uh, Russian propaganda in, in many cases. And for example, they uh, first uh, didn't use the, war, the word war, they used the uh, special operations, what was the, the narrative of Orban. And there was even um, a complaint that uh, they gathered uh, what, were the, what were the false or questionable statements diffused by the public media. Like, uh, for example, Putin says he's protecting the Russian majority population of Donetsk and the Luhansk countries, or um, Putin launched the operation referring to genocide, or the West is shooting itself in the foot with sanctions against Russia, just to name a few. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not uh, without, uh, without being uh, absolutely covering all the, all the things. And uh, what we can see in public media that they invite experts, which are like um, a bit dubious experts because they project or they, they give their opinions from the Russian narrative. And this is really dangerous because for those people who don't uh, look it up in the, on the internet or who don't speak other languages and who watch uh, the, the, only the state television, they, they have an a, a absolutely false uh, opinion. So they are uh, also the, the, the issue is that uh, Orban has been uh, big friends with Putin. And I have to correct you a bit, uh, Otmar, because he visited Putin at the beginning of February uh, yeah. and he came back. He said that that was a peace mission and there is no way that there would be a war coming. So they, uh, they didn't know. But uh, on the other hand, when the war really started, there, was, there were a couple of days of um, break. And uh, after that, they picked up the narrative that they provide peace and the opposition wants to send wants to support the war that was the main narrative and because they had the all the all the means of uh, of communication they could transmit this message that uh, the opposition wants war and he wants peace and he wants to provide the gas for the hungarians and he wants to stay out of the problem and he just wants to represent the hungarian interest and I just have to add one more uh, element to this because Markizai had an unfortunate interview in one of the online um, uh, independent uh, talk shows. He said that he, he was asked several times whether Hungary would send soldiers if NATO asked for it. And then the, the Markizai, who is not an experienced politician, mm -hmm. he said that if NATO asks for it, then we do whatever they ask for. And that was the, the half sentence that they took out from the context. And that's what they put on the billboards. And actually, Markizai was on the billboards, but uh, as a subject of negative propaganda. So that was the thing that they, they uh, really managed to uh, put the orchestra on this, put this on the orchestra. And um, this half sentence was disseminated in all the country. So everybody said, okay, my son or my husband could be taken to war, which was not true. So that is the thing that outright lies were said in, on public television and on billboard campaigns. And that was a, a very decisive element in, in, the, in the winning of the elections. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, let's well, also interesting Otmaya. that, uh, sorry, that um, Hungary... Uh, voted for the quite harsh sanctions against uh, Russia, against uh, uh, 800 uh, politicians and, and oligarchs, and, uh, you know, also hitting the, the enterprises, freezing the assets. Hungary uh, adopted it, but apparently they didn't talk a lot about that uh, in, 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 in Hungary. Mm -hmm. Well, like. just one comment that um, uh, Orban is always, um, uh, uh, he never says when he's supporting sanctions against Russia openly. You know, he, he I, in my opinion, he was most probably uh, pushed by Polish uh, leaders or by the other, um, like the Visegrad group, or I think some, they told him that he should support, he should, you know, adopt the, the sanctions. But 
Uh, you never heard about it. I mean, what I just told you that uh, in the meantime, on public media, they said that the West is shooting himself uh, in, the, uh, yeah. in the foot with the sanctions. So they they were uh, put it, relativ relativizing the the impact of the sanctions in the mean in the same time on public media. Communicating. He said, yes, he was in Brussels at the meeting, mm -hmm. and he. Uh, he could have vetoed it, but apparently he didn't dare to do it. But uh, yeah, that's... Looks that's like an opportunistic uh, political move and uh, showing in each target group whatever they want to hear <laughs> and trying to um, uh, get uh, uh, still a hold on political alliances that he could use. Um, let's uh, stay a little bit. Of course, we have Press Freedom Day um, with uh, the topic of press freedom in Hungary. Hungary has uh, been dropping 69 places down the Press Freedom Index between 2010, there it was on place 23, and 2021, we um, found it here on place 92, a period that exactly coincides, as you said, Esther, with the reign of Viktor Orban, who is prime minister since uh, 2010. So um, the media landscape uh, was uh, formed to his needs. Uh, the journalists, they either dropped out, it couldn't get into buildings, as we heard before um, from Otmar, um, what are the journalists doing? Where is the free thinking going? Uh, how is there an op still an op is there still an opposition? Uh, who does um, uh, read and watch them? And why doesn't the civil society oppose? <laughs> A lot of questions at once. <laughs> I have to say that uh, there have been many demonstrations. Like um, I participated when there was like index uh, was there was the takeover of index. There was a big march all over Budapest. Many people uh, walked in the street to the streets, and uh, it had no impact. And that that was that is also the thing that uh, we can go to the streets. Like in the case of the Central European University, there were several protests. There was a life chain around the university. Like ten thousand people went down to the street in Budapest, but no impact so it, it didn't have we couldn't achieve anything with those demonstrations and uh, what you can see that uh, for example club radio is has gone online so they continued online because they didn't have any frequency anymore and they every half a year they make a fundraising campaign because they don't get any funding uh, from um, like they don't get funding from the state that's one thing but you have to see that uh, even uh, companies don't dare to um, buy advertisement spots in those radios. And that's, again, a thing that there is this uh, fear of retaliation that if they uh, try to advertise something in club radio, then they might get some revenge from the government. And it applies also for other um, uh, independent media sources or like, uh, you know, outlets. And uh, that is also um, a big problem that state companies only advertise in state, in government uh, owned and government controlled news media outlets. And, and the thing is that I know that some, new, some journalists have quit the job because it's, it's totally uh, difficult to, uh, to survive. And, um, but I have to mention the, re the, the birth of telex.hu, that age you. Uh, the former journalists of Index stayed together and they did um, community fundraising and they managed to start a news a new uh, news site which is called telex.au and it, they seem to function. So what we have to do is to each and every one of us uh, we have to support financially those uh, independent media outlets. That's what we can do. Like I, 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 um, so I by, um, you know, Magyar uh, Narancs, which is also a, an independent newspaper, but we have to pay for it online. We have to know that if we don't pay for it as a, an individual, then it will not survive. So this is what, what uh, we are trying to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Otmar, would you like to um, comment the situation in the yeah, last decade as, as of the media landscape? As far as I know from, from Hungarian colleagues, and, and we have a, a section in, in, in Hungary as well, and uh, what I was told is that uh, apparently a lot of uh, independent journalists or critical journalists went to these platforms on internet like Telex, uh, but there are others uh, but of course, it is not enough, and uh, they they can't pay 
um, uh, higher uh, normal salaries. So uh, for the for the profession as a journalist uh, in 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 Hungary, it's it's really uh, it's, they have they face harsh times and. Uh, uh, so I think these crowdfunding, as you mentioned, I think this is uh, crowdfunding is maybe the the, the only way to to uh, support these uh, um, media outlets. Uh, the last kind of there is a weekly, I think, still with uh, H uh, B G Hetivila uh, Gostashak. What's it uh, in Hungary, Hungarian? They that still works, uh, and and as you mentioned, Mogyo Noranc, but um, there's one daily I think left, which is quite okay. I forgot the name. Um, it's Nepsava. It's Nepsava. Yeah, Nepsava. Mm -hmm. And it, it, is it uh, on the newsstands available? Yes, it's printed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's virtually the only one, mm -hmm. as you said, the only daily left, uh, which mm -hmm. is independent or critical for the government. And do they have advertisements? No, not a lot. Huh? Well, that's the same issue that uh, they don't have uh, state advertisements. They might have um, smaller companies, but it's also this kind of adopt, ad, adapt, adaptation, you know, that uh, um, companies are also afraid, you know, to mm -hmm. use in sure. those those media outlets. Show themselves. And RTL so, is still working, I think, but... Uh... RTL, Which one? The, TV, the TV station? RT yes, RTL, uh, RTL is still working, but uh, RTL is also taking a bit more cautious. Uh, uh, my impression is that in their news, they have some political content, but there is bigger, um, like, criminal news content or, you know, like, a bit more mm -hmm. natural disasters or, you know, like, wow. uh, accidents and this kind of stuff. But they, they still try to try to report uh, from also political issues, but it still exists. Yeah. But to sum it up, most of the free media of the opposing um, media has been silenced, bought out, sued out of business. Uh, to um, take a look at what uh, what measures are possible. Um, also, there is a, seems to be a pretty anti-democratic climate within um, reacting uh, towards civil society um, wishes. <laughs> Uh, the EU was reluctant uh, a long time uh, to really put uh, Article 7 into um, practice. Uh, now it's finally uh, has done so. Um, what are your um, hopes? Um, what do you see could happen when uh, the rule of law proceedings uh, really uh, come to work, when the funding will be uh, stopped? Uh, this is one of the questions. What are your hopes or um, uh, or so out uh, uh, looks, but also why has the EU been so slow uh, to your opinion? These two questions. Um, I would like to uh, comment on this, the, the speed or the, not the, the slowliness of the EU. I think that at the beginning, they that there is a so-called peacock dance of Orban that he uh, starts this negotiation and he changes two minor things in the law and then the EU says hmm, they change something but the, me the, the, the main uh, content of the law doesn't change. Uh, there were some, um, uh, you know, some people spoke up against it but then it basically the three days were over so uh, they, they thought it might change or it might not be such a big problem. It took really a, a long time uh, for the EU to realize there was the, the there was the Tavares report, there was the Sargentini report, there were many reports uh, until the EU really realized that there is a fundamental problem in Hungary. And I also have to mention that in 2018, if I'm not mistaken, uh, a think tank, a media, free, a media think tank, uh, uh, filed a complaint to the DG competitive, uh, competition uh, for the state advertisement and the state funding of media. Because just one addition, additional detail, I just calculated the state, the public television receives around 270 million euros a year. So they get a lot of money and it's, it's totally... Um, uh, unbalanced in the meantime, but the DG competition was not was reluctant to, to do anything because still the Hungarian market or the, the benchmark was probably not high enough for them. 
that we, ha- we are a small country, so you can have almost like 80% of the whole media landscape, but it's still not big enough uh, for the, it seems, to react. So there could have been other instruments to use uh, before this uh, rule of law mechanism. But what I sincerely hope that uh, uh, because they give it uh, to the government without uh, real um, accountability, that's the problem that uh, uh, we didn't, Hungary didn't want to join the, the European prosecutor. So we are not part of that scheme. And Uh, you have to know that the Hungarian national prosecutor is a founding member of Fidesz. So he will never go against, uh, he will never uh, do the, his job, what he was, he should do. For example, the son-in-law of the, of the prime minister had a huge uh, uh, file in Ola, at Olaf. Uh, and finally nothing happened. And they decided rather to pay back the EU money instead of prosecuting him. So mm-hmm. there, is a, there is a whole system that the Hungarian legisl- legislative system is not, not, or the jurisdiction is not capable of, of uh, or not willing to deal with these issues. So transparency and accountability has to be provided for the EU funds somehow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, it is... Uh, It's good that this finally, uh, um, that this new um, mechanism uh, is in place and can be used. I think Hungary, especially Viktor Orban, tried to oppose it for a long time, uh, especially in when, when the new budget was, um, was uh, um, adopted uh, a year, over a year ago. Uh, he could have put his veto and uh, I think he threatened to do it. But uh, at the end, I think there was no chance for him to to avoid this new mechanism. But there's one problem with this uh, mechanism. It, it doesn't work for uh, violations of um, democracy, of democratic standards, of uh, the, the rule of law. It's only applicable when EU funds are uh, touched. So um, we need a new kind of method for, uh, for that the state can uh, can be fined or can be um, uh, that that funds from Brussels can be reduced to some member countries when they are violating the standards of uh, democracy, rule of law, media freedom, etc. This is still lacking, so the EU should uh, introduce this uh, pretty soon, because the other, the other, the new mechanism is, works only for, for the EU budget when, when, when funds are uh, in, 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 in play and uh, so and and it's true that the uh, eu kind of uh, woke up very late uh aej my organization we 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 pressed for for um, a new regulations from the eu uh, but the former commissions were not really interested i think it's only since uh, Uh, especially since uh, Mrs. von der Leyen is president, and especially Vera Jourova, the vice president from from the Czech Republic, um, she I think she's really committed, and uh, we had her sometimes on on Zoom, and she told us, uh, yeah, I come from a country in my youth, I. I, I had the censorship, I had all the communist uh, propaganda, disinformation, etc. Uh, so uh, we have to re- react, but without um, establishing a kind of new censorship on media. So she, she was also a bit afraid that when the EU is acting uh, against media, then it might be... Um, People might think that this is a kind of new censorship from from Brussels, and uh, she wanted to avoid it. But I think she now uh, is really serious about it and uh, came up with a lot of new uh, ideas and, and and regulations. 
and a, a final word to the to what you said, Esther, about the public prosecutor, the, the European prosecutor. Hungary opposed it. Uh, I mean, how can that be? The, uh, Hungary is a member of the European Union. Why is there no kind of uh, the EU has to push uh, Mr. Orban to accept this public this this new position? Huh? He can't. Uh, he can't uh, uh, kind of uh, step back and say, no, we don't want to, this prosecutor. Uh, so here EU again has to, has to act. And uh, it's also very strange that uh, uh, Hungary accepted the prime minister, the former prime minister of Northern uh, Macedonia, uh, Mr. Gruevsky, uh, Hungarian diplomatic cars helped him in escaping <laughs> from uh, a call from a trial in his country uh, and, and brought him to exile in, in Budapest. And uh, I think he still lives there. It must be a nice place, uh, apparently, or a little villa uh, from his friend Viktor Orban. And, and again, uh, it's it's impossible that uh, I mean he's looked uh, after by by his uh, country by by the court by the judicial uh, authorities for a lot of uh, crimes and corruption etc. But uh, he can live in Hungary in in peace and and with his money and and under the protection of the Hungarian state. I mean. What kind of image do we uh, have for for the new applicant countries like uh, Northern Macedonia that we kind of uh, give a safe haven to to criminals? I mean, this is this is really ridiculous, and and uh, nobody seemed to care in 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 Brussels. Which is really uh, a lot of big worrying. questions you raise here of why is not anyone doing something. Um, a related well, question is the big the big concern of this one disciplinary measure uh, cutting down the money that that even could backfire. So uh, this um, was one of the concerns why uh, it wasn't uh, implemented. The measurement, the Article Seven measurement, that um, by by now all the EU money has been uh, um, given to Orbán's. Uh, use uh, but all the future money that is not coming into the country will be used for pro negative propaganda as well because now it will be cut um, when when giving it to the people so um, it could be used for anti-european uh, um, uh, communication um, and uh, the question is uh, is there a fear um, in that direction in hungary that uh, the eu measures might hurt hungary and uh, it might even backfire well um I have to say that I also heard this reasoning that that's the reason why we do, why they don't want to to take serious measures because uh, it could backfire. But Orbán did a huge anti-Brussels propaganda even without the EU doing it. There was a stop mm -hmm. stop Brussels campaign, which was again these billboard campaigns all over the country. And I mean, you don't need to do anything special, you will get the anti-EU campaign because Brussels is always blamed for whatever is bad, like the high energy prices, it's Brussels cause, it's Brussels fault uh, that the energy prices are high. And um, just one comment on the Gruevsky case that I'm as a former diplomat, I'm totally ashamed that uh, the diplomatic service, the Hungarian diplomatic service was actively participating and used for this to uh, bring Grevsky out of, Ma of North Macedonia. And I think now he is even sentenced to five years imprisonment uh, in, the in, in his home country, but he still lives in Budapest. Okay, uh, so that, that, that is, that is a, a, a really a, a, an issue which is unacceptable for me uh, also as a, as a, a pro-European minded Hungarian citizen. It's, I don't understand how, how it can go on like this. Uh, but um, just going back to the Article 7 procedure, uh, that could be a tool, an instrument, but the problem is, of course, unanimity. And I think that now we have this conference on the future of Europe, and there are some key points that uh, should be taken into consideration. And this is one, one important thing is that unanimity gives the blackmail power to those countries 
where there is an authoritarian style leader. And Orban could really blackmail, as you just said, Otmar, uh, during the negotiations of the uh, framework, budget framework. And this was absolutely not fair. I mean, we are recipients of EU uh, support and we blackmailed the whole block uh, with our veto. And then we try to, I mean, this is uh, for me um, unacceptable, for, you know, on behalf of the EU. Why they, why it can be like this? And this is totally, totally unfair. So I think unanimity is a, is a huge obstacle for, mm -hmm. for development and efficiency of the EU also to react in the field of uh, foreign policy or security policy and all kinds of fields. And uh, the other thing is that really uh, the existing instruments should be used and the Commission should not be afraid because the Commission is the guardian of the treaties. The Commission should uh, uh, really withhold Article 2 also, the basic values. I mean, that's why we, we have the commission and the commissioners that they should be more efficiently representing the basic values. So we, we have higher expectations on behalf of the EU and they should not be afraid, in my opinion. <laughs> Mm. Talking a little bit across the borders and also looking again into uh, the possibilities of the EU, um, one of the measures uh, to put free uh, media under pressure is um, these uh, so-called strategic lawsuits against public participation, the SLAP mm. uh, lawsuits. There is a new measurement uh, of uh, the EU uh, to try to counter uh, these strategic lawsuits to shut down investigative journalists. Um, Otmar, could you tell us a little bit more about that uh, situation? here in yeah, uh, it is uh, these are the famous uh, defamation lawsuits that uh, especially big companies start against uh, investigative uh, journalists uh, or media and uh, these so-called slap uh, lawsuits uh, have risen in, in in numbers in the last years and uh, um, uh, we had a talk with an expert from uh, from Albania, interestingly. She works for the European Center for Press uh, Media Freedom in Leipzig. And she told us that apparently, until now, not one single case was really um, um, finished or uh, no media organization or no media outlet was um, f fine so far. So it was just done to kind of uh, to, to, to uh, intimidate uh, journalists because of course it's a problem for every journalist when you get such a uh, a suit against you, of course, the, your owner will have to engage uh, a lawyer, uh, which uh, costs money, and and they want uh, the, um, they 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 ask for a lot of uh, high sums for fines, like one million euro and more. So of course the 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 um, fees of the lawyers. Uh, very high and it, it could lead to the end of, of a media outlet or a magazine or, or an internet portal. Even in Austria, we had uh, a few of these uh, cases so far. And uh, so it's very good that, uh, again, Mrs. Jourova, apparently it was her initiative, that um, only last week it was uh, introduced as a new... A uh, proposal for a directive from Brussels that uh, it, it uh, that these cases should be um, uh, it, it should be made more difficult for the plaintiffs uh, that uh, they they should not uh, be able to kind of intimidate with these lawsuits uh, whole magazines and and investigative. Uh, uh, research networks and um, the only problem is uh, this new regulation if it will be adopted i hope so uh, will take maybe several months or even a year 
until it will be adopted. Um, but it is applicable only for cases uh, cross border. So uh, there has to be at least two member countries where these cases are uh, uh, have, uh, effects on. Uh, so just national cases are not uh, protected by this new uh, regulation. So we need, we still need uh, national regulations to uh, block these or to, to, to make it more difficult, these uh, uh, slap cases. So Nana, you're right, uh, uh, especially on this day of um, press freedom. World Press Freedom Day. We have uh, we have to uh, to we have to be concerned that these cases, uh, the, these lawsuits, uh, should be fought uh, by by the EU Commission, and and we need some more um, regulations about it that uh, these. Um, companies these these uh, big companies should not be able to to shut down uh, media companies it's not uh, there's nothing that has nothing to do with media freedom and uh, in that case i i i, I hope that uh, there will be some more regulations to come and uh, let's see uh, in austria the i talked to our minister of justice who, she is mr zadic from from the greens they are aware of that but they are kind of uh, waiting the situation and, and observing the situation in in europe and then they might uh, start up uh, a, a national law but this of course will will take some time take time what i hear um during our discussion also is uh, some kind of a wish towards the european union not to only end anonymity um, and to avoid the threatening of uh, um, uh, just um, uh, decisions but also that uh, the eu might uh, be stronger in uh, getting the possibility to ask and demand democratic basic uh, um, situations, values, um, uh, human rights, ground rights, rule of law, um, things like that. So there might be uh, mm -hmm. civil society in question and in demand to mm -hmm. demand these um, uh, these uh, changes within the EU and to empower the European Union to do so within the nations themselves. Um, I would like to come to our last uh, question and uh, I would like to introduce it uh, with a quote of Pulitzer Prize winning historian Anne Applebaum. She also writes for The Atlantic and she recently published an article titled There is no liberal world order and she states... Unless democracies defend themselves, the forces of autocracy will destroy them. This is quite a strong quote. And considering the frightening success of uh, Viktor Orban's re-election, uh, reinforced by manipulation of laws, by um, economic influence of uh, major industries, institutions and universities that the, the regime is taking, and uh, uh, also effectively sculpting the media landscape according to his needs, and also by uh, unfortunately um, being attractive for several other countries who um, kind of even admire these autocratic developments and want to do it as well. Um, a question to you now, um, how can and should the still intact democracies defend themselves? What can they do? What can we do to avoid such autocratic or anti-democratic developments? Big question for the final. <laughs> I, uh, if, I, if I may start now, uh, I think that uh, it is absolutely um, uh, and dangerous within the EU to allow uh, this erosion, this democratic erosion, because it will provide the example that uh, you can get a lot of money, you can spend it as you want, you can cement your authoritarian power, and there is no, no reaction or no, there is no wall, you know, you can just go wherever you want and nobody will stop you. And uh, I think that uh, uh, also what we could see um, 
Fortunately, in Slovenia, um, Janis Janca couldn't win the, the last elections, but Orban also tried to uh, buy media outlets in Slovenia. Actually, he bought media outlets in, in, uh, in Slovenia. Mm-hmm. He tried to support uh, uh, Janza's re-election. Uh, he gave um, a big credit to Marine Le Pen uh, that was uh, uh, first uh, uh, in secret, uh, that there was a Hungarian bank who gave a credit uh, to for the campaign of Marine Le Pen. And then it turned out that it was MKB and it was a huge amount because Marine Le Pen couldn't get any funding, any, any credit from, from French banks. So what we see that... Um, uh, it's it's also the interest of of other EU member states to 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 get, to provide the resistance, this democratic resilience within the EU. And the problem is what we see that uh, as long as we are a candidate country, there is a strong system of criteria that you have to uh, set up democratic institutions, you have to adopt laws, regulations, directives, etc. But as once you are in the EU. Uh, there is nothing, nothing. So you can do whatever you want. And this is a a really bad example, especially if we see there is Serbia as a candidate country for the EU. And uh, Orban is really pushing for taking in Serbia because uh, we never know what his intentions are with that. But um, I think that uh, uh, to give money, for example, on behalf of the EU without this, accountability and without uh, real um, uh, transparency is, is, is really a bad thing that they, that should be stopped simply. And uh, there is one important thing, the, uh, the principle of subsidiarity, that the spending of EU funds uh, is really intergovernmental. So the EU gives the money to the government and the government decides to set up a structure to, di- to distribute the money. And for example, after the 2019 uh, municipal elections in Hungary, Budapest was won by an, uh, an opposition mayor, and there were some bigger cities in the countryside who uh, were won by the opposition. But then the government systematically took away the funding from those places. So in my opinion, real subsidiarity would help the EU uh, this democratic resilience, because if cities or regions could also apply for for projects for funding, that would uh, uh, reduce the power of the government uh, to uh, over the money. Because of course, money money is the, is a really important um, influence. Mm-hmm. So th- this would be one thing that uh, I think the EU should really consider, and accountability and transparency is. And, and the existing, the using of the existing measures more bravely, you know, not, not to be afraid. That would be really important. Thank you very much for your clear vision. Otmar, what are your ideas? Well, how normally, to... uh, if I might add to what Esther just said, uh, normally the EU uh, watches really very severely how money is spent uh, by the member countries. And uh, they even can ask uh, money back, uh, and and they have Olaf, the the uh, fraud, the anti-fraud uh, police, and uh, but they should they should have more power and and maybe control better the the spending of of EU taxpayers' uh, money. Um, uh, interesting that uh, Marine Le Pen uh, got a credit from Hungary. I didn't know that. I just knew that when this was a few years ago, she got uh, a credit from a Russian Czech bank, uh, <clears throat> something like, uh, I think, 5 million uh, euro. So now after Russia, she gets money from, from Hungary. Uh, this is really worrying. Uh, one thing which is uh, a bit more positive you know, with Article 7 procedures, um, till now it was possible that uh, uh, only one country should be kind of uh, backing the um, uh, country which is uh, um, sued by by you, more or less. Uh, then um, they couldn't make any fines like the so-called atomic bomb uh, 
against uh, a member state that, for instance, the voting rights uh, will be suspended, huh? like Article 7. So in the case of Hungary or Poland, both countries, both governments helped each other and uh, kind of till now uh, more or less uh, 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 did not uh, block uh, kind of uh, fines against themselves. But now with the uh, with uh, the Ukrainian war, the war in Ukraine, and uh, uh, I think uh, maybe Hungary has lost Poland uh, as an ally. Um, we will see. Some people say the Visegrad countries more or less are more or less split now, and uh, <clears throat> um, you know that it was Prime Minister of Poland and and uh, the Czech Republic uh, and. Uh, Interestingly, from Slovenia, they went. Uh, they were the first prime ministers of the European Union, going to um, to Kiev and seeing uh, Mr. Zelensky after the war. So uh, th there is some hope that maybe these new, these old alliances could be uh, could be stopped. And uh, Hungary, Victor Victor Orban will have to take care. That he has maybe no other allies when he, when Mr. Janja is is uh, no more in office in uh, Slovenia mm -hmm. and maybe Poland, uh, so he he could be fine. So I mean Hungary could face now with Article Seven severe more severe consequences, uh, maybe even uh, more fines and and. Uh, uh, maybe even that that would be really the atomic bomb, uh, what they say in Brussels, when uh, the voting rights are suspended for, for, for a time. Um, but of course, there is some danger with that, because uh, the as we had it in, in, in Austria, when the sanctions, uh, so-called sanctions were applied against our first government with the right-wing party back in the year 2000, uh, it, it it backfired because uh, people, the Austrians, were felt themselves somehow sanctioned by Brussels. So uh, I'm sure that Mr. Orban will play the same uh, card and say, ah, Brussels is now the, uh, taking back uh, the money which belongs to us. And, and uh, uh, so here the other EU countries will have to take care that... Uh, these, uh, if the, really this this uh, fines uh, and, and and suspending of voting rights should take place, uh, uh, but let's see. It's um, it, it it could be maybe for the first time uh, could be used against a member country, which I don't like because uh, normally, yeah, uh, I like Hungary as a country. I like the Hungarians. I'm quite often there and. Uh, um, but it's, there is a danger that if you cut subsidies, that uh, it might be, it might be, uh, there might be the next step might be kind of let, let's let's leave the the European Union. Huh? I think Orban already uh, said that uh, the the Hung exit or how it was called is is an option. Huh? Um, I don't think that he will really like, especially now with the war at his border, at a Hungarian's border. Uh, I think he he won't uh, try to to leave the European Union like Great Britain, and Hungary is a smaller country. So I mean, they are of course they are NATO member, but uh, it's not so easy, and even the bigger Great Britain faces a lot of problems with uh, having left uh, the European Union. Yeah, but let's hope that uh, maybe also through these external influence, uh, a kind of new feeling of togetherness, that a kind of European wake up call for the Europeans to do more, um, especially to do more in foreign policy and maybe even in, in the military fields that uh, EU needs a kind of military 
um, arm. This is a kind of military capacity because we can't rely always on the United States. Uh, if there are conflicts, um, smaller conflicts uh, in our neighborhood, uh, I think the European Union should be capable to, to have a military capacity to, to intervene or at least to defend uh, European member countries um, in addition to NATO. Thank you very much for your um, broad outlook, uh, what should be done, what could be done. And I would like to take um, uh, the, the wish for a more uh, united Europe, um, a more democratic, resilient Europe from the both of you. And uh, now for our final um, thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much uh, for this highly interesting and informative uh, discussion and good luck to all your efforts uh, for free journalism and for more democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Union of European Federalists.